Okay, it looks like it's five past, so let me get started. And so uh, this is just a quick reminder, we're discussing uh, the axisymmetrical order equations of that swirl. Um, here you've seen them many times, here they are again. Here are the basic properties. And um, we have a these formulas, which, which we'll need today, we'll need this shortly for, uh, and so these are analogs of the Biot-Savart law on the half plane for this equation. In particular, we'll, we'll see this again in a little while, so let's forget it now. Well, here, here um, this is, uh, I'm calling this elsewhere, the energy of omega. And that's really the, um, so it's, it's a quadratic function of omega, but it's also the L2 norm of the, of the velocity field uh, generated by omega with the right weight, with the natural weight. Um, and there's a factor of pi for some, because, because of, uh, at some point we integrate out in the, in the theta rules, we have, we have a two pi and there's a factor of a half more than the energy always. Okay. So um, this, this will be relevant soon. Okay, and then we've, we've proved this lemma, I should probably call it a proposition, showing that uh, some conditions which are all uh, uh, stated in terms of conserved quantities, these conditions um, imply a vorticity concentration. In this sense, they imply the vorticity concentration around some point x star. And uh, the r component of x star is close to one. Um, okay, good. And uh, so, and let me point out, I've, add, I've added an assumption here, which I didn't state before. And so the, um, I've added, uh, I've added this uh, up around, the theorem doesn't require that, but I do, but I want it for what I'll do later on. And um, we can assume it if we want to, we can choose uh, omega such that this holds. And so I'm kind of cheating by adding stuff that I, didn't discuss before, but this doesn't change the veracity. I've, I've just added another a redundant hypothesis to this lemma. Um, okay, but now I want to consider the axisymmetric order equations of that swirl with initially satisfying these, this uh, condition two, so all these properties. And uh, the theorem we stated is, well, first of all, remember we had to, we had to rescale in time. We had to define a new, uh, say, a fast time variable, tau. And so, um, when tau goes up to order one, the original time variable has only gone up to one over log epsilon. Um, and, so, uh, and so the point is that the fast time variable is the appropriate uh, time scaling in order to see these vortex rings moving with velocities of order one. Um, okay, and so the theorem is, well, uh, we take initially to satisfy these conditions we just looked at. Um, and then what do we have? Well, the, the, by the previous lemma, we have that for every time um, tau and for every sufficiently small epsilon, there exists this uh, x star, the approximate center of vorticity at time, the x epsilon star of tau, the approximate center of vorticity at time tau uh, with the r coordinate near the line r equals one and, uh, and around which the vortices is concentrated in the sense of equation five, I think I asked you five. Um, and so the new assertion is simply it tells us how, uh, so we, we have this, this um, blob moving in the half plane, the R coordinate is always supposed to one. It tells us how the Z coordinate is moving. And so the Z coordinate moving with velocity one over four in the plus Z direction, if I have this right. And then once we do this, we could consider different radii. We could consider um, instead of vorticity of circulation one at a distance, one from the uh, vertical axis, we consider vorticity of, of, of circulation gamma at a distance uh, are not from the vertical axis, then we would get a corresponding law of motion, which would be, um, well, yeah, the instead of one over four pi, we would have gamma over four pi r naught. We'll write that down later. Okay, once we understand the basic case, we can just change variables and get the general case. Okay, so we start proving this, um, and the proof is going to rely on this idea. And so here, here's what we said uh, on uh, yesterday, I guess. So the point is, um, oops. This uh, uh, somehow I have two different phi's in this equation, and they should all be the same. So this phi. So let's say all phi's are the same function. Um, okay, and so uh, I guess it looks like I have a, a, a different file only once. 
Okay, so we, I, I read on this test function, fine. And I'm going to locate the center vortex, deep, uh, and I, I'm just interested in the z component, the vertical component. So I'm going I'm to locate that by uh, multiplying by phi, multiplying the vortex by phi, and integrate. And so I choose the um, I choose phi so that in the R Z plane, I did this in a slightly silly way, but uh, it doesn't matter. In the R Z plane, um, okay, let's. Uh, Um, here is R is one. Um, so, so phi is equal to one in some region like this, or rather here phi is Z minus the starting, minus uh, the place where the Z component starts. That's in this region. And uh, this bigger region, uh, let's make it more visible, is the support Okay, so that's the support of five. And um, so I'll just work with this test function throughout. And uh, okay, so so far we said that uh, um, if f is sufficiently small, then um, by, uh, well, okay, so phi actually had the form, um, uh, here it is. Uh, f of r times g of z, where f is, f looks like this, and g looks like this. Uh, okay, and so this is g, and this is z, and this is the initial z naught. I, if I wanted to, I could just assume that z naught is, is, uh, is zero, but for some reason I didn't do that. Okay. Uh, okay, so then um, we said that uh, then um, if epsilon is sufficiently small, then we know that this, uh, we know there's the center vorticity. And if epsilon is sufficiently small, then the center vorticity lies within the region where f is equal to one, um, well within that region, if we like. And so then really all we're seeing is what g is doing. And uh, and so if epsilon is sufficiently small, then we multiply by, we, we multiply phi against omega epsilon. We can pretty much pretend that phi is equal to g of z. And, and so this is going to be g evaluated at the center of vorticity plus small error terms. Here we're using uh, properties of this vorticity concentration model. Um, okay. And, uh, and, so, and so if, uh, if somehow the center of vorticity is within this region, then this g of z is exactly, it tells me how far z at time tau is moved from its original, its original location. So the last, uh, the last equality holds only if, uh, if we've moved less than distance one. Okay, and so the goal is to, um, so we have this, this quantity here that tells us what we're interested in. It tells us how far the vertical component has moved. And we can use this identity to control its motion and estimate its motion. And so we're just, we'll just you know, work with these things and do what we can. Um, okay, and, we, and so far what we proved is uh, this. Um, I'm gonna get rid of some of this clutter. So, so far what we proved is that the time derivative of this uh, quantity, this phi times omega epsilon, which again is telling us what the height is, what the z component is up to smaller, that that's bounded. And, uh, and this incidentally uh, shows us why this 
logarithmic rescaling of the equation was, uh, was necessary, at least it was necessary for this estimate. Okay, and so now our goal is to do more. Um, let me, I recorded a, oops, that's not what I want. Um, so we'll do a first lemma on, uh, which is recorded. And so, um, and let's speed it up. Okay, and so let me, so it's convenient to define, uh, say, zeta epsilon of tau to be this functional, the integral of phi against omega epsilon of x tau. And so zeta epsilon at time tau is this integral functional, and it should be close, to, and what I want is for zeta epsilon to be basically the same as z epsilon of tau. Um, and so my claim is that, uh, my, my first claim is that there exists a time t greater than zero uh, with the property that, um, the center of vorticity, the uh, zeta epsilon time tau, remains close to its initial position, remains within distance one half the initial location. Um, let me stop for a second and say, uh, um, if I look back up here, so, th so this, is the, um, this is the place where we summarize the properties of the center of vorticity. Here it is again. Um, so we have this, uh, uh, center of vorticity here um, with components uh, R epsilon of tau and Z epsilon tau. And uh, the point is, um, it's not really uniquely determined by these conditions, right? And so this is, this is just in a ball of radius uh, uh, R epsilon around the center of vorticity, I, I find most of the vorticity. And so it's possible that, that there may be, uh, that, you know, that I'm able to perturb the point a bit and, um, and still satisfy that. It's not uniquely determined, but it's, it's but I can see it's uniquely determined within. Um, uh, well, so so this is true for every R, um, and, and so I can choose uh, an R so that you know. Uh, this has the, so that at least one half of the vortices vortices contained within the ball of radius R epsilon, and then or maybe at least three quarters. And then I see that any other candidate for the center vortices has to be can can be not too far from there. I can have two disjoint balls who each contain more than three quarters of the vortex. And so, although the Z epsilon is not uniquely determined, it's determined up the scales of epsilon. And, you know, if I want to, I can define a, I can choose a, I can choose, because it's, um, because there's this flexibility, I can certainly choose a map from tau into Z epsilon tau. I can, I can make a measurable selection of that. I, I, I can make it be non-measurable if I want to, but I can also choose it to be um, measurable. I can choose to be piecewise constant, for, for example, I think. Okay, so, um, so here we have this uh, Z epsilon tau, the approximate center of vorticity. And um, although it's not uniquely determined, it's uniquely determined up to scales of order epsilon. And I'm gonna prove that it doesn't move too far for short times. And so um, let's do that. And so uh, first for any time tau, well, if I look at uh, this, uh, so again, Z epsilon is the integral of phi against omega of this thing. Function. And so zeta from tau is, which is by the triangle inequality, is um, zeta epsilon. Of, uh, let's see, this is too slow. Uh, zeta epsilon of zero. So, so I, I use the triangle inequality first. And then um, the first term I can estimate using, I know that zeta prime is less than a constant. This is what we proved uh, before. And uh, this should be the. Um, absolute value of tau if I care. I guess I was considering tau positive. Um, and then I know that zeta epsilon times zero is, uh, I know that zeta epsilon is telling me the z epsilon uh, within, uh, with errors of one, one, one over log epsilon. So I have this. And, uh, and so then um, uh, if I choose this tau, if um, I choose tau less than t, and t is less than c over four, then c tau is less than a quarter. And I can, and if epsilon is small enough, then one over log epsilon is less than a quarter. And so uh, this thing will be less than half. Okay, and so I'll, I'll write this repeatedly, um, you know, uh, without being precise about epsilon naught, uh, there are conditions that we can guarantee by choosing epsilon small enough, such that, such as, um, you know, this is less than a quarter. Okay, um, so, 
continuing. Um, uh, so I know that this, this functional is added from the integral of fecus omega is less than a half. And I know that uh, I know that this um, we proved before that the integral of phi is close to uh, is close to this uh, g of g of z uh, with errors, which again I can uh, sort of make as small as I like by choosing epsilon small. Okay, and so um, if uh, Um, if so, if, if zeta is less than half, then then this g of z is less than a quarter. And remember, and the point is that g of z it it's it looks like this. Um, sorry, it's less than three quarters, and so uh, it's it goes up to height one. And and so if g of z is less than three quarters, then either it's in this interval. Um, where uh, z minus, so g of z epsilon of tau is less than three quarters. So either it's an integral where z epsilon of tau minus epsilon of zero is less than three quarters, or it's outside here. And um, and then the point is, well, you know, it starts out being, it, it, it starts out with the center vortices being inside here. And uh, and then I know that at every time, um, either it's in here or it's in there. And I also know because, um, well, okay, so so we can say, for example, um, if the center of vorticity is uh, is within, um, uh, let's pause for a second. Um, if the center of vorticity is within this interval, then most of the vorticity is within a slightly larger interval. Right, it's, it's uh, then you know all but a, all but a, a tiny fraction is within the interval of length, um, say two times four fifths rather than two times three quarters, and uh, and so um, we have these two cases. Uh, in this case, if the center vortices is, is close to the origin, then the vortices is concentrated in, in a slightly bigger in a slightly bigger region, less than four fifths. And if the center vortices is far is bigger than one, then the vortices again is concentrated in a slightly bigger region. Um, so I have one of these two things, and and the point is, well, I can't jump from uh, from this scenario to the other scenario because the vortices is moving continuously in L one. Um, we know in fact that the vortices is transported by ODE, and so it can't just jump from scenario one to scenario two, and um, it starts in scenario one, and it remain and in, in at at all times over time capital T is in one or two. And therefore, it has to stay in condition one, which says that uh, that uh, this must hold for all times in the wrong consider. Okay, and so here I'm we're basically we're just messing around uh, um, rather straightforward considerations to uh, control to, to say it can jump basically. Okay, um, I think uh, that's all I want to do with that. And so, um, okay, so the lemma says uh, for short times, the center of vorticity uh, stays close to where it started within distance one half. And as long as it's within distance one half, I can use this quantity to, um, to really tell me what is the z component center of vorticity, because this, this last equality requires z epsilon of tau minus z epsilon of zero to be less than one. And we've just arranged that holds up to time capital T. So, um, okay, and so this data is really telling me how far in the vertical direction the, um, uh, the center forces the forces has moved up to small errors. Okay, good. And so uh, what we want to do now is then um, control this, understand what this is doing. And um, so before trying to prove things, let's just look at the right-hand side and, uh, and see if we can understand what to expect. And... Uh, so let me again draw a picture. Um, well, let, let, let's let's say this. So let's say that the let's let say a be the set of points uh, x, which is R Z, where um, phi of x is equal to one, and uh, and b is everywhere else in the support of phi. Uh, 
sorry, phi of x uh, is equal to, uh, let me, phi of x is equal to, um, uh, is equal to uh, z minus z epsilon of zero. Okay, and so the picture we had before was this. We have a, a region in the RZ plane. And we know that uh, this region A at least contains, it goes from, I think, two thirds to three halves. Two thirds to three halves. And it goes from um, Z of zero minus one to Z of zero plus one. And so, the, so uh, that's the initial Z of zero. Uh, that's that's um, uh, that's a and then um, everything else is b b is the count is the part out here okay and so what we know so far is that um, that if epsilon is small enough, and if we consider times after this time capital T that we fixed, then the center, so epsilon small enough means that the center vortices is, is very close to R equals one. So it's certainly between two thirds and three halves. It could be between nine tenths and 11, 11 tenths, for example. Um, and so, and, and uh, the Z component is between plus and minus a half uh, in this picture. And so, um, so, so, so far, so we know that um, we have if epsilon is small enough and this holds, then, then this x epsilon, the center of vorticity at time tau. Uh, is in is in the region A. It's in the and the distance for, of x epsilon of tau to B is bigger than I don't know what one tenth. Um, for example, by choosing by choosing epsilon uh, small enough, we can arrange that. So uh, and that's a parenthesis. It's not needed. Um, okay, and so um, and so now let's look at these uh, these integrals. Um, and so here's my claim. Uh, so I just want to understand what to expect. Um, and so let me imagine. Uh, so the the whole work is going to be proven later on. Uh, something close enough to what I'm now imagining. So let, let's imagine. Um, as in the song, let's imagine that uh, it's easy if you try. Let's imagine that. Um, well, so what do we know? We know that we know the vorticity is pretty is pretty concentrated in a ball of radius epsilon. So let's imagine that omega epsilon is, is really like uh, one over pi epsilon squared. That's the maximum of. Uh, um, well, times the the character function of a ball of radius epsilon at some point uh, x epsilon. Um, okay, and uh, okay, so what we know is that omega epsilon of r z over r is at most one over epsilon squared, but r is close to one here because uh, because of um, we've we've uh, shown that's true. And so, so let's imagine this. Um, and uh, and so, I mean, we already know this if we're willing to, uh, you know, um, interpret this charitably enough. Okay, and uh, let's imagine that. Um, well, so what we want to know is we want to know what the what the velocity is doing. That's what appears on the um, 
you know, here. We want to know what the velocity is doing, and let's let's suppose that it's doing sort of the same thing it would in uh, in R two, and uh, u epsilon is like the um, x minus y perp over x minus y squared one over two pi, I believe, omega epsilon of y t uh, tau d uh, y. Um, and of course, we know this isn't true because uh, the the greens the kernel is really different. For, is it, I mean, it looks different from from, from the uh, BO star kernel in R two. But on the other hand, well, okay, we're we're we're, we're imagining now. Uh, okay, and so then, then what's going to happen here? Um, then, uh, okay, so then we should have um, the integral of this thing. Well, um, okay, so, so the point is, in um, in this region A, this function phi is linear. Uh, there it is. It's a linear function. In fact, uh, yeah, it's yeah, the, it's, it's a very good linear function. And so, um, so the second order is vanished in A, and so this is really uh, and the second orders are support and, and of course the second orders are their supports contained in the support of phi, and so this is really the integral over B. Of okay, and this is just uh, not going to matter. It's some combination of uh, second derivatives of phi and products u i u j occurs a u r u z components of of u divided by log epsilon. We could work out if we wanted to which second derivatives get multiplied by which combinations of of components of u, but it's not going to matter. Um, and so the point is that, well, uh, uh, if, if this is true, um, if this is true, we know, we know what U looks like in terms of L2. We know that the, we know that, uh, the total, that the L2 norm is, blows up like log epsilon. But we know that all of the diversion part of the L2 norm is concentrated uh, in a small uh, uh, neighborhood. Of this blow-up center, so so certainly um, within uh, so, so the part outside of ball radius. Uh, well, so I mean, so our assumption is that so the um, so every point in B is a distance at least one tenth, say, from the center vortex T, and there the um, there this should be bounded, uh, and so the the the, the amount of vortex T, so this is. Uh, it's less than c, um, and the integral uh, will so the, the the second derivatives, and let's put an r here and an r there, um, a, a constant who depends on phi, involving the soup of the second derivatives of phi divided by r, um, and then the integral over the distance of x to x epsilon of tau I mean, over the, um, so I look at the ball of radius one tenth around the center of vortex T. I look at its complement and I integrate the omega or the uh, u squared over log. And um, and that should be O of one. That should be that should, that should be a little O of one. So again, the total uh, we expect all of the, the integral over the, the whole half plane of this 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 thing um, of u squared times r is diverging logarithmically, like log epsilon. Um, but all of that should be concentrated near near the center. And so if we if we look away from there, um, it should be little one. In fact, it should be a little o. It should be one over log epsilon. Um, it should go to zero. 
Okay, and so then uh, I'm looking. I'm I'm imagining computing the uh, time derivative of, of the uh, left hand side, and I have these two terms, and I've just persuaded myself that the first term is not going to contribute anything, but epsilon goes to zero because it involves integrals of the L2 norm of this L2 quantity who, uh, where I'm uh, away from the only point where the velocity is blowing up. Um, okay, so uh, continuing to imagine, let's ask what, what should the second term be doing? And um, so, sorry, okay. so these are questions. questions we, uh, and so um, the second term, The second term is uh, minus gradient one over R tensor grad per phi Hilbert Schmidt inner product with U tensor U. And let's put the factor of R here. Um, okay, and then we divide by log epsilon. And, uh, and so this is the integral over well, we, can, we, we only need to look at the support of phi and the support of phi has these two pieces. There's the place where we know exactly what phi is doing. And the other place, the place where we're far away from phi, uh, from the center of vorticity. And this should, I continue to exercise my imagination, this should be Uh, for exactly the same reasons. And so this involves um, quadratic quantities in, in U divided by log epsilon, and then stuff that's just um, bounded. And so when I integrate uh, by the same reason, I'll get something who, who vanishes as epsilon goes to zero. And, um, and so when, then let's take a look at this. And so for this, uh, well, this has the advantage that here in this region A, we can compute the gradient of phi. So grad, Perp phi is uh, it's minus dz in region A. It's exactly minus one comma zero, and we can also compute uh, the gradient of r times the gradient of one over R. Well, gradient remember is d dr d dz. And so this is R times minus one over R squared zero. Okay, it's minus one over R zero. Uh, I'm not sure I like this. I'm gonna get a sign wrong. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. I, I, uh, okay, so there's a sign wrong someplace. Um, but, uh, okay, and so then, then uh, making these substitutions, the integral over A of this, um, the second term. Uh, what is this? Well, um, so so what this is is it's it's uh, the this ends up being uh, u dot the gradient of one over r, which is exactly uh, the r component of u. Uh, so this is minus. Um, well, it's. It's this multiplied by um, grad perp phi, which is uh, which is up here, um, and that's the same. Thing. It's almost the same thing. Uh, divided by log. Okay, and, uh, and so this is exactly 
Um, looks like uh, one over R times the R component of U squared dr dz divided by log epsilon. Um, integrated over the half space. Okay, and so uh, let's see if we can figure out what we expect this to be. And, um, and uh, this, so this will be, um, so recall, so we know, um, that the total energy, which is a conserved quantity, it's pi times r times u squared dr dz. This is like uh, one half log, well, it, it, it's equal to one half log epsilon plus uh, some, something that's bounded lower order. And so, um, and so, uh, so what? Uh, so what, 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 again, what we expect is that the, well, so we're, we're gonna, um, we're looking at region A where the diversion part is concentrated. And so we expect that most of, um, so expect that most of the energy will be concentrated there at the, uh, the, the L2 norm. And we also expect that, that we're integrating over region where R is close to one. We expect, this is that all, almost all energy, all of u squared is concentrated near uh, this x epsilon of tau, where r is close to one. Um, so expect that, and we might expect that the integral of u r squared is uh, about equal to the integral of u z squared. u, and what, what is this? Uh, and so if they're both equal, then they should both be um, one over four uh, log epsilon. Um, Except up here, what did I have? I had a pi someplace um, in the, oh, here it is. There's a factor of pi. And so um, this should be one over four pi. Well, I guess one, um, because they add up to, uh, once I divide by pi, they add up to one over two pi log epsilon. And, uh, and if they're roughly equal, and then uh, each one gets half of that. Um, Okay, and so if we believe that, then uh, then well, because uh, because of this uh, hope, then we can sort of ignore that and say, well, okay, one over r is the same as r, whatever, and um, and so then, so we might guess. that the integral over A of this stuff should be, um, and, and here it's, uh, it's R grad gradient of one over R tensor grad perp phi U tensor U um, over log. Um, so, cause I'm dividing by the log, this will be about equal to one over four pi. This is what we expect. And um, let's look at the theorem. Let's see if that's right, except I have a minus sign uh, because there was a minus sign here. So the minus sign is not a happy, uh, not a happy occurrence. But in fact, what we what the statement theorem says is that the, it should it should um, the velocity should be one over four pi with the, with, the, with the wrong sign. So, so uh, presumably my sign is wrong. So I have to fix that someplace. Okay, and so. Um, so all we have to do is, is to do this more precisely. 
And uh, so what did we do? We, we uh, well, basically I, I made a lot of kind of unjust, un, uh, unjustified or not yet justified assumptions about what this, so I know, um, uh, okay, so, uh, so, so my assumptions were, well, I, I kind of assumed that the, um, right, so this is, this is a competition we've done a bunch of times. We know, it, we know that if the vorticity really looks like um, what I wrote down here, then we can compute the velocity or we compute the velocity and we know it does what it said to do. Um, and so, so we have to say, first of all, well, we, we know is the weaker uh, information we have about vorticity concentration sufficient to prove stuff like this. And, um, and crucially also, we have to know what, what is the actual BSR kernel in, in this axisymmetric setting look like? I mean, it was this, so I, I was, so this was really the, um, the shaky part in my hand waving argument. And I'll have to do this uh, more carefully. So, um, but this is the, but this, uh, 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 your very, you know, hand waving argument um, is a roadmap for the proof. And uh, let's see what the next lemma is. So, so basically what I have to do is I have to understand better um, how to reconstruct the velocity from the vorticity. And I have a formula, but it's not a very, it's not a very transparent formula. So, um, Let's look at the first lemma. So the first lemma is this. So the formula is um, that uh, uh, u u of x is in this notation uh, the axisymmetrized Biot-Sirac kernel. times r prime, and so again, at, uh, r prime, d r prime, d, uh, 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 what do I need? I'm, I'm missing the vorticity. Omega of r prime z prime, d, d r prime z prime. Okay, and so I have to, I have to know what this, uh, what this is. And, um, and this had some, some awful expression that I'll we'll recall in a second. And, uh, and so the point is here, we're writing it down. So according to this lemma, it has, uh, we can write it in the following way. So there's a, a leading order piece, which is really the, uh, exactly the BOSR kernel on the plane. And, and so this will justify, or this will, will help, uh, help us justify the, um, uh, the, my imagination uh, from before. And then uh, there's the next piece, so, so the, the linear piece blows up like one over distance, one over x minus uh, x prime. The next piece has a much milder singularity. Um, it, it has a, a, log, a logarithmic singularity. And then uh, the remaining piece is basically bounded um, as long as I'm looking at points who are not too close to the, uh, uh, to r equals zero. And, and in this computation, r is always bigger than a third because the support of the, the test function phi is, is there. So, um, Okay, and so if I can do this, I can hope to, and so the idea should be, well, um, when I, at least in terms of L2 norms, when I'm computing the uh, L2 norm of U, um, this leading order piece should be by far the dominant contribution. And, uh, uh, and so that, that's what I was imagining. And so uh, the, the program is to say, well, okay, on the one hand, we, the vortex doesn't look, doesn't look quite like what I assumed, but it's kind of close. Um, this concentration on it. And um, on the other hand, uh, the, the kernel is not quite, quite like what I assumed, but it's a, it's a small perv, I mean, it's a, um, it's a, it's an almost bounded perturbation of the BSR kernel on, uh, on R2. Um, and uh, for, for things close, for distances close to, uh, when X minus X prime is close to zero. Okay, and so the program is um, prove the lemma and use it to justify the above computations. And I don't know how much of this I'll do in detail. Um, I'll write it all down in detail and post it on my, on my webpage. But, uh, and you know, I, I may, if I'm, if I'm organized, uh, what I'll do is uh, write up the computations and then just uh, go through them, flash through them quickly uh, using modern technology, using slides 
uh, so we can sort of see how they go. But anyway, let's let's look at the starting point. Let's, so let's understand why uh, why the leading term in this uh, axisymmetrized um, B of R kernel is actually at the um, logarithmic kernel that we're or is the uh, the um, B of R kernel that we're familiar with from the plane. And so here's the starting point. So here's the formula for um, uh, this quantity we're interested in. Let's multiply by R prime. And uh, what do I want to do? So, so the first thing I'd like to do is, well, so, so here's the point. Let me write this as, um, so here there's the cosine alpha in the first term. Um, let me write this as, uh, I'll change the second term. And, and so the first term is the coefficient of the, uh, is the, co uh, it has an E sub R. So this is the, this corresponds to the R component of the velocity. And the second term is the E sub Z, corresponding to the Z component of the velocity. And um, so, Let's write this as uh, r minus r prime times cosine alpha plus uh, what's left uh, r r prime r prime times uh, so um, I added a r prime cosine alpha. R prime, and so I have a, uh, what have I done wrong? This is backwards. Uh, and we have a R prime and a one minus cosine alpha, I believe. Um, okay, and so, uh, and so then uh, what else will I do? I'll, I want to um, uh, get rid of this thing, and so I'll um, I'll divide by uh, r r prime, and then that brings out a factor of r r prime to the three halves. But I like that because now, um, well, so then I then I'll have a. Uh, Maybe better do from zero to two pi. I don't care. So, um, so one factor is a z minus z prime times a e sub r and a r prime minus r times e sub z. Uh, and then I'll have, um, and, and I can actually bring that out of the integral. Uh, and those get multiplied by the, um, and then I also have a factor of r prime in the numerator and r prime to the three epsilon denominator. And so that's probably uh, r to the three halves, r prime to the one half. Um, and then it's multiplied by the integral from zero to two pi of cosine alpha over um, four pi, and let's call it a s plus uh, plus two one minus cos alpha d alpha, where s is um, r is x minus x prime squared over r r prime. Okay, and then there's another piece uh, involving um, uh, I guess just r prime times one minus cosine uh, no, 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 sorry, it's, uh, so this is, um, uh, it's an E sub Z. Uh, so, um, so here I have a, a unit vector in the R and the Z direction. The other piece is only a vector in the Z direction. Right, there's only this. And, um, and so it's a, 
E sub Z, and then I'll be I'll have an integral involving um, well, it looks like just uh, this. Um, uh, one minus cosine alpha over four pi. Okay, so this is a this is in parentheses. Four pi uh, times s plus two one minus cosine alpha, and then there's uh, some factors of uh, like uh, r prime. Um, uh, so, so here I think I have a r prime over r to the three halves, maybe. Um, I have a factor of r prime here and another one there. And uh, this. and so the point is that, um, uh, so, so this is just a function we can, this, this is a, a function of alpha, let's call this f1 of alpha, and this is some function f2 of alpha. And, um, and I can see that the first part, well, uh, it doesn't exactly, it doesn't yet look exactly like the bios curl, but I can see at least it's doing the right thing, it's purely rotational. Um, and so we have to order at the magnitude, how big it is. But um, if it ends up be behaving to leader, leading order like uh, one, over, uh, one over distance and magnitude, then this will really be the, B the bios bar kernel. And then the other pieces will give rise to the other terms. And, and we can see uh, at least, you see this E sub Z is, is this um, zero, one there. So the, the, next, the next correction term will, will be only in the Z direction. Um, Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll go, so we can see um, what the plan is. Uh, it's a lot of calculus and I'll go over it quickly. Um, you, you know, I was, uh, I, I didn't say whether or not I'm gonna have classes next week. I sort of threatened to cancel classes. Um, uh, Uh, any thoughts? And so my, I'm, 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 kind of, I'm kind of torn. It'll be a busy week, but on the other hand, I'd like to finish this stuff, finish this discussion, maybe by um, typing things and flashing them quickly in front of your eyes. Uh, and then, um, so we can start something new after the workshop. Uh, so um, I guess I'm gonna plan for now to have a lecture on Monday, and uh, but I've told you what the agenda is. The agenda is just to, is to is to quickly show you the details of uh, when I've already I've already sort of presented the idea of the proof, and so um, I uh, encourage you to yeah, if you're if you if it's more interesting for you to if you and you're limited time to go to some talks at the workshop instead of uh, the ones um, instead of the, the lecture on Monday, and. Uh, and that stuff will be online eventually, anyway. Okay, let me quickly, uh, the, the class is over, but I'd like to, um, I'd like to look at uh, the schedule for the meeting next week and uh, tell you talks that may be of, of a special interest if there are any. Um, okay, it's here, good. So, uh, um, well, okay, so here's our colleague, Boris Kaysen at Toronto. If you're interested in knowing what he's doing, that'll be an opportunity. Um, well, let's see. Uh, this vortex dynamics for the Lake equation is, is very closely related to the, what I've been discussing now. So that's uh, kind of interesting. This uh, desync relation vortices and leapfrogging that, that's a that, that's a you know a proof of an important result. Um, let me see. Uh, this one de la Hose on uh, Wednesday at three p.m. is likely to be mainly numerics, and so on the one hand he'll talk about you know fourth order Runge cutter methods and stuff like this that may or may not make sense to you, but he may also have nice pictures. Um, uh, the talk of Vega is likely to. Um, have interesting conjectures and phenomena. I mean, the, the technical part may be a little bit, maybe too technical about things, but 
but this is true. And uh, so, um, but many of these will be interesting talks. Okay, sorry, I've, I've, I've taken too much time. But anyway, uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to discuss them. And uh, that's, uh, that's all I have for today. So, um, okay. And let me say, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm not just talking. This class is over in minutes ago. Yeah, in as much as the class, but um, I copied this lemma from, I copied the statement of the lemma from paper of Mark Yoro and uh, from this 2000, it's the paper of Mark Yoro and Buta from 2000, from actually this year, uh, 2020. And, um, and, the, and so they, they state this lemma and they prove the lemma. And step one of the proof is they say, well, you know, uh, they, they exactly do this. Um, they write the they rewrite this kernel in this form with these intervals f1 of alpha and f2 of alpha, and they say, well, you know, in an earlier paper from 1999, we computed f1 of alpha and f2 of alpha, and they look like and they have these forms, and those forms give rise exactly to, you know, this uh, log of one plus distance over di over distance and so on, and so uh, if you look at the earlier paper, it doesn't quite it, in fact it doesn't it, it, I mean there's the lemma which computes these things, but it doesn't do, uh, it doesn't do it in such detail. They get only, you know, fewer terms of expansion there than they claim here. And so, okay, easy, yeah, just to fix it up. And, yeah. and so I tried to reproduce their, their technique. And actually I got um, some different expressions for these than uh, what they, than what they state. Um, and so, you know, it's possible I, I just, uh, I can reconcile, I mean, that they're only different on, different on the surface and they really are the same. Um, but it's also possible that one of us is wrong, either them or me. And uh, I wrote it kind of carefully, so it seems like I got the details right, but who knows. Um, and I, I, I don't think it affects the proof. I, it, so, so these are just uh, corrections to the error terms. And for this uh, proof, all we need is the leading term. But uh, um, <laughs> that's it. So when I, when I do this, I'll type an argument which is correct, uh, you know, as correct as I can make it. And uh, it's possible that I've, you know, that, that uh, again, so it's possible that either me or these uh, uh, other authors are, uh, have made a little error someplace, and then uh, I'll be grateful that I can find that and fix it. And that involves you know, this kind of horrible calculus, evaluating intervals, stuff like that. Um, okay, so again, uh, I'm just talking and, any questions? I'm delighted to answer them. And uh, also, uh, Toronto will transition off of daylight savings time over the weekend. And so, if you're in a place that is so, um, you know, so nine o'clock here uh, on Monday will be um, what only 160 seven hours after nine o'clock last month or something like that. 168, 169, there's no straw. So, okay, good. Uh, let's, ah, Lars. Hi, uh, sorry to, it's always always me bothering you. I, I would have a quick question on, uh, on the support of your test function and the region A and, and okay. B. So I figure it's, it's really important that um, say, Say a is kind of independent of epsilon does not shrink to does not shrink to to zero if uh, yeah. say if 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 you if you if you had to, if you didn't have that um, zeta moves on the on the right time scale so this tau time scale then basically uh, the support of phi would the region a would shrink to zero no and you couldn't use this property anymore yeah you would have, yeah so this is exactly an issue if you try to uh, so um... Okay, so uh, yeah, this question arises if you imagine trying to prove a theorem like this for uh, for uh, vortex leapfrogging, um, and so there there the setting is well, well. So so the best theorem of this sort is one where we have um, so uh, what happens? Uh, so there's a, a better theorem. The, the, the status the, the state of the art is if you take initial vortex, who looks like 
um, some blob here and some blob there. And, and the distance of the radii is order one. Then, um, then each one moves with its own velocity and they, and to leading order, they don't interact. Um, and so each one moves with velocity proportional to one over radius there. If you want to see the leapfrogging, um, so for leapfrogging, you need one to, to overtake the other one, basically. Yeah, well, you also need them to be closer. So you need to have um, a distance. They're all, say, distance order one from the axis. But then um, the distance from each other is smaller, like uh, maybe log epsilon to the minus 1 half. And so if I want to track one of them individually, and I try to put a test function around it, as before, I need it to be on a, on a small scale, on a scale that shrinks. Um, so this is exactly the, the, the problem you were envisioning. And yeah, things go wrong. Uh, bad things happen. And, uh, and this is, what makes, it, this is uh, what makes it a hard problem from this, from, from this approach. Uh, and then there's this approach of Del Pino and collaborators, which will be presented next week in conference. Um, a completely different argument, which, uh, um, yeah, well, which, which we'll see next week. Um, you know, when I was young, they used to say there are two kinds of mathematicians. Um, you ever heard of this? What kind of, they're, they're, okay, here's a test. There are two kinds of mathematicians. What are they? Okay, well, they're, 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 they're problem solvers and they're uh, theory builders. So the people who solve problems, the people who, 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 who construct theories. Um, but is, is this something that you people have heard in your generation, this generalization, uh, this classification of mathematicians? Yeah, so I would say now uh, uh, a lot of mathematicians in the PD world, especially in particular, are neither problem solvers nor, nor, nor theory builders, but they're machine builders. And so what they do is they build machines to solve problems. Um, and this is true, for example, of, um, of, uh, of well, well, the Del Pino and um, the Del Pino team. Um, so they they have they they construct this machine involving generation for uh, for um, for solving, and, and and it's true of, of many uh, groups. And so the uh, the work I'm presenting now uh, of Mark, and this is really due to Mark Yor and collaborators. Uh, he, that guy is a problem solver. And so he, he just drills into the problem and solves it. Um, but, you know, at some point, uh, you know, the machine built by many people and maintained by many people with collaborations of many people uh, can get more done. Um, so, uh, okay. Anyway, you know, I'm just talking. Um, Thank you. You don't, any more questions from anyone else? Anyone other than Lars? Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll um, stick around for two minutes in case anyone thinks of anything. But uh, other than that, I'm uh, done for the day. But yeah, this, this, this is an issue. Uh, this is, so um, yeah, this, this here uh, is so, so one one would just need to do everything on a more uh, with more precision, and it's not clear that precision is available. Um, and uh, so, so when the leapfrogging actually happens, they still say they still remain at some at some distance. You have a lower bound for the for the distance. Then yeah, otherwise, so the, um, this would not work. No. Yeah. So what happens with leapfrogging is, in principle, there there are three scales. There's the order epsilon scale, which is sort of the scale of vortex concentration. There's the order one scale, the the radius of the rings, if you like, the distance from the vertical axis. And then this intermediate scale, um, which as I've drawn, and it actually can be anything. So so leapfrogging means a combination of so, so you have these collection of vortices who are all translating together, and as they translate, they they rotate around each other, they, they interact, and so. Um, there are a bunch of scales, roughly speaking, anything between one over log epsilon and log and log epsilon the log epsilon the minus one, log epsilon the minus one half. Uh, anything in this range, you can say you see a uh, leapfrog. Um, for bigger distances, the translation dominates; they translate at different speeds. And for smaller distances, uh, they they sort of rotate, but they don't really go anywhere 
the, the, the translation is accurate. Um, but yeah, so you want the intermediate scale to be preserved. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, and uh, this is, so it's an older, I mean, older result, meaning a few years old for, for, for gross Pityevsky and their a theorem of myself and Smith's. And there we chose the intermediate scale to be log epsilon to the minus one half, which is in some way the, the, the uh, largest distance at which one sees this vortex of leapfrogging. And so then in the time in which the vortices travel, a distance order one, they rotate around each other order one times, but that means moving small distances. It means moving distances of order, well, again, log epsilon to the minus one half in, in the rotational. Okay, and, so, and so there, the rotational motion is slower than the translational motion, but, uh, but you're looking on a time scale in which you see both. Um, okay, there's a question in the chat, which I can't answer. Um, okay, uh, anyway. Um, okay, I feel like people feel obliged to stick around here as long as I'm talking, and so... Uh, if you, you know, please, please leave if you uh, have anywhere to go. Um, and uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I guess I'll sign off and I'll see you guys a bit later.